The UK is an island nation. Our lifeline to the world is the sea. Tankers transport fuel, container ships bring us essential supplies, and cruise liners carry holidaymakers near and far. But who are the faces behind these fleets? Meet the Merchant Navy. In Britain today, almost 6 million tonnes of cargo and 5 million containers pass through British ports every year. That's over 90% of the UK's trade being moved by ship. And it's a growing industry. Also on the increase is cruising. The last 10 years have seen passenger numbers almost triple, with one and a half million Brits taking to the ocean waves every year. For the industry, this means making bigger and better ships. And one of the latest to serve the British market is Ventura. Today, she's sailing into her home port of Southampton for the first time, in preparation for her maiden voyage with three and a half thousand passengers. Almost a village on the sea, this superliner is a major feat of engineering. At 290 metres, she's the equivalent of 35 London buses long, making her one of Britain's biggest. It's no wonder she's attracted such a massive crowd of well-wishers. It makes you proud to be British that we've got one of the most beautiful ships that belong to us. She's absolutely fantastic. She's lovely. It's, it's awesome. Absolutely <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> also waiting with anticipation are new trainee cadets, James Ingram, Paul Acker and Andy Carr. They're about to board ship for the first time. Ventura will be home for four months. This time last year I was um, probably in the snow on a building site, maybe on a roof or something, freezing and uh, didn't really know what was ahead of me. But now I'm joining this like absolutely amazing ship and, and people just can't believe it and neither can I. I've never been on a cruise ship before. I've never even seen one in first hand, so this should be a first for me. <laughs> I am a bit nervous about going on board, only a little bit, but um, just about uh, meeting new people and uh, what the work's gonna be like and how hard it's gonna be and things like that. Three cheers for Ventura! Head, head! It's been a labour of love to get her here. In Monfalcone, northern Italy, the last 19 months have seen over 3,000 people toil to complete her. But finally, after her last series of stringent tests, she was handed over to her owners and set sail for Britain. Captain Alistair Clark is the man in charge of the biggest ship in the fleet. This is obviously the pinnacle for me to be uh, to pointed to a ship like this. And bringing it home to Southampton again, that's the highlight, really. But in just one week's time, another important milestone is scheduled. The official naming ceremony with Dame Helen Mirren as godmother. Before that day, this ship will be filled with 2,000 company employees for a shakedown cruise, designed to test every service on board. So far, things are looking good. The ship has sailed away from Monfalcone, the birthplace of this mighty liner, and I think we've coped very well. Bye-bye. Right, -bye. Darren. Good morning, Chief. I've just had my... Uh, as Chief Technical away. Officer, Ian Mark has a busy two days ahead of him. I look at my role as being in charge of anything that goes up and down, in or out, round or round, switches on, switches off, basically anything that needs to be maintained. With 40 years in the job, Ian takes this responsibility in his stride. For new recruits, Andy, James and Paul, right, it's a different story. Life on board is about to challenge them. After six months at Warsash Maritime Academy, they're joining the ship for their first sea posting. Part of a three-year course, these weeks will give them vital hands-on experience. Welcome home. 20-year-old Andy has traded life as a builder for his deck cadetship and has high hopes. 
it's always nice to think about um, being on a bridge and uh, with all your four stripes on your shoulder and your captain's hat on. And me and my friends that are here, we've, we all joke about it and we joke about who, who might make it to captain and who won't. Paul gave up university and student debt to train in electrotechnical engineering. I just love electronics. I love making things beep. <laughs> and for trainee engineer James, a life on cruise ships has been his goal from an early age. I went on a um, cruise when I was 10, and that's what really, really made me want to go to sea. For the rest of the crew, it's final preparations before the ship sets sail again on her shakedown cruise. Up on deck, second engineer Bradley Dykes is testing the swimming pool and remembering his first sailing as a cadet. When I first got my cadet ship, uh, I got posted on a world cruise. That, that to me was fantastic. I was over the moon by it. My family were as well. And uh, to be honest, I didn't know what to expect. And when I was the first moment on board, I was uh, bewildered by it all. I didn't know where to look, who anyone was. It was crazy, crazy talk. But uh, th there was a lot to learn, and uh, I just thought, all right, I'll have to have my best shot at this. And it's happy swimming all around, really. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye. With the final checks taking place, the passengers start boarding. Welcome on board. Thank you. Just go around here, take this up for Barbados stick. For the trainees, though, it's time for full-on concentration as they take a tour of the 19 decks. So this now is the entrance into the arena theatre. But it's not long before Andy gets distracted. One of the um, main uh, appealing things for cruise liners is there's, there's quite a few uh, dan dancers and entertainers on board. The dancers are just a legend among cruise ship cadets. Have you seen any of the dancers yet? Uh, I've seen one or two of them around the place, yeah. Luckily for the dancers, they're well out of Andy's reach in rehearsals. Yeah, they're all right. And one and two. I've had rumors. Right and sit back. Friendly. Friendly. Yeah. Attractive. Young. Oh, well, no. Three and four and five. Female. So. But no time for distractions today. Deck Cadet Owen is setting Andy the task of finding two locations around the ship. But as with most first-timers, Andy's about to find himself on a wild goose chase. So, first place I want you to find is the Boston store. Right. Then the spare funnel locker. I think you can manage that. Possibly, yeah. That's good. Now, obviously, ships don't carry a spare funnel with them, but I'm going to see whether he cops it or whether he's going to go looking for the spare funnel locker. Senior cadet Tom is being more kind. No joke locations for James. It's important for James to know where a few certain uh, key safety things are on the ship. Um, two of these been the fire locker, the emergency generator. Get on your way. OK. It's a big ship. Definitely potential for him to get lost. With the added advantage of maps, James immediately starts off with a success. That's the emergency generator. One down. Oh, this looks promising. Oh, no. I think we're at the uh, wrong end of the ship, actually. Not a good start. And with no maps, Andy has to ask. Buy the accommodation. OK, thank you very much. Cheers. I don't think I need a map anymore. Hi, welcome aboard the Just stop on deck directly in front of you for reception. <laughs> with almost six miles of corridors to negotiate, everyone needs help. Do you know where you're going to? I'm generally aiming for this pointy bit here. Doesn't look like it's this way. With Andy still struggling, James is almost there. It's getting a lot easier to, you know, find find each individual deck and remember which deck I'm on and which end of the ship I'm at. Found it. Yes! Ta-da! There's the race of the One down for Andy, but with task complete, James reports back to Tom. Ah, here you are. Yeah. All right, well done. Below deck, Andy hasn't found mystery location number two, but he is about to make a very important discovery. We've just been wandering around the ship on our way to find the um, spare funnel locker and happily stumbled across the dressing room for the dancers. Ah, that's what I went to see for. Do you know where the spare funnel locker is? Spare funnel locker? 
But funnily enough, the spare funnel locker is still proving elusive. Time to phase Owen. Hi, you're back. Hello. How are you going? Well, I don't know, really. How would you go with the spare funnel locker? Well, not very well, really. I didn't actually find it. There's no such thing as a spare funnel locker. We don't carry a spare funnel around with us. I probably needed the exercise anyway, but yeah, cheers. With the engines ready and passengers on board, Ventura is all set to sail. That's everything up and running, ready to go. To actually get off the key, start on even if it's a little trip to go on the first trip. Yeah, Pretty amazing. Good. I've had quite a day, I've got lost lots. And uh, yeah, it's quite good now to just be standing around watching us leave. It's probably the last chance we'll get to do it as well. Because we'll be working next time. <laughs> It may all seem like plane sailing now, but coming up, problems below deck means Ian has some decisions to make. To shut that whole steam system down would inconvenience people up in the, uh, the passenger decks. And it's literally all hands on deck for Andy. I think I'll probably be a professional pretty soon. The British cruising market is rapidly growing, and the latest ship to fulfill our desire for a life on the ocean wave is Ventura. After nearly two years of construction, this feat of engineering set sail on a shakedown cruise, a voyage with almost 2,000 employees set to test every system and service on board. All going well, she'll be ready for her naming ceremony and maiden voyage in a week's time. Today, Britain's latest superliner is anchored in St. Petersport, just off the coast of Guernsey. And while the deck crew test lifeboats, the engineers are testing systems under the watchful eye of Chief Technical Officer Ian Mark. Up on deck, the passengers are taking advantage of the sunshine. One almost permanent passenger is Alison Mark, wife of Ian. She's preparing Ian's uniform for this evening's captain's cocktail party. 34 years we've been married and I've known him for 37 years. I think we were married a year before I was allowed to go on the ship with him and I was on the Uganda for two weeks and the Canberra for one week. And then after that, I didn't go on a ship again until we'd been married 20 years. I had two children by then and uh, the girls weren't allowed to go on. Things have changed now, uh, where my wife can actually travel with me, but in those days, it was hard being away, and you had to put your mind to your work and forget about it, write your letters and wait for your mail to come in. I wanted to retire early, but she said, that what, after all these years of bringing the two daughters up, right, for you to come home, she said, now you've seen the world, I want to see it as well. I've had the, the good fortune to have been around the world three times, and it's been tremendous absolutely tremendous and I wouldn't have missed it for the world. On deck, it's all systems go for the crew if they're to finish their vital checks before returning to Southampton. The ship's new officer trainees are taking this opportunity to get as much hands-on experience as possible and Andy Carr is helping test the tender boats. This is probably my only chance in my career to learn how every part of the ship works. I'm a sort of person, if I'm going to do something, I might as well do it properly. Engineering trainee James Ingram is in the bowels of the ship on a tour of the engine room, the scale of which is proving to be daunting. It's uh, absolutely massive. As soon as you walk into the engine room, the first thing you see is the is main engines and, like, they're, they're pretty big, you can't really miss them. But, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that looks, it all looks quite similar. After 40 years on the job, a man who knows this engine room intimately is Ian Mark. Today, he's doing his daily rounds. Well, I have to go around the machinery spaces and most areas around the ship that have machinery inside. And it's basically just to make sure that it's functioning correctly. I equate what I do in the mornings by walking around the engine room as a doctor doing his rounds. Right? When he visits all his patients. I'm not saying necessarily mine have something wrong with them at the time but I'm walking around making sure that they don't develop into something more serious. No small job. To meet the needs of the 5,000 staff and passengers, the engine room runs the entire length of this enormous ship. 
A lot of people don't realize that when they're sitting there enjoying the comfort of a show or their dinner or the they're swimming in the pool, without the engines, none of that would be happening. But they're about 90,000 brake horsepower, which probably equates to about 190 Ferraris. On his rounds, Ian's discovered a problem. The leak, I suspect, is from the steam system that we use to provide the hot water and, and heating in the galleys and such like. It's very important uh, that uh, they're identified earlier on uh, and not left because to shut that whole steam system down would inconvenience people up in the, uh, the passenger decks. Discovering problems is the whole point of this shakedown cruise, and the passengers have uncovered a fault in their cabins. Electrotechnical officer Darren Vass is on the case. There's been a few complaints about the satellite TV and the reception being poor, so uh, we're going to go and check out the uh, above decks equipment and the dome and the antenna and uh, make sure everything's in order. It's really big uh, focus point because a lot of people watch TV, and if it's not working, there's going to complain quite quickly. OK, Jesse, Jesse, could you operate the antenna, please? In hazardous mode, please. The deck crew, meanwhile, have discovered a faulty pontoon. It's unsafe for passengers. We've just uh, put, put out the ramp, and it doesn't actually work. It's a bit of a seesaw at the moment. Second engineer Bradley and his team have been called to sort things out. Back in the broadcast room, Darren's been successful. So the TV reception is much better now. Yeah. One of the hardest things is TV reception because of the constraints of low signal strength and location of antennas and location of the ship uh, at sea. Bradley's team also have a solution. I'll take away the, the bottom plate. Hopefully then it'll fit. It is fixed, yes. The boys in the shop did a good job. So, problem solved. But is Ian happy with how the day's gone? We haven't um, encountered any serious problems. We get the little niggling uh, problem here or there, but nothing too dramatic and uh, nothing we can't handle. It's been a good day today, yes. Everything is ship shape and passengers are happy. Ventura is ready to sail home. Bridge, that's four engines on, propulsion and six thrusters running. for the cadets to relax before the evening's much-awaited captain's cocktail party. For deck cadet Andy, his familiarization with the ship continues, and he's made an exciting discovery. I've been uh, wandering around the ship, and um, I found the circus school's running, which is pretty cool. So uh, I just have to get up here and um, get involved, I think. Yeah, he's just offered me his job, actually, but I don't know if I'll take it yet. I think I'll probably be a professional pretty soon. That's it, that's it, that's it. There you go. Cool. Yeah? Pretty much a gymnast now. It's going well, it. as you can see. Free time over, the ship is gearing up for the highlight of the cruise, the captain's cocktail party. It's a chance for the cadets to prove their social skills while mingling with the passengers. And this evening, those passengers include the company Movers and Shakers. Extra pressure then for 19-year-old James, whose first cocktail party is daunting enough. Going to your first one, it is a bit nerve-wracking. You've got to put, you know, you've got to, you've got to always have a face on and sort of like be really, really polite and try not to make, make any mistakes, especially if you get asked questions about the ship. As soon as you put this uniform on, you really feel as if you're living sort of like a, a life of glamour. Let's go mingling. Indeed. If James was nervous about mingling with 2,000 passengers, then he's found a new solution to help settle himself down. Gin and tonic. Yeah, I'm a bit new to the gin and tonics. I've never actually had one before, but um, yeah, perfectly nice. I mean, 
I suppose I've got to get used to them. It's a, kind of a classic drink on cruise ships, so... Andy has no such nerves. So I've done half an hour or half a mile just before breakfast. <laughs> A successful cocktail party to end the cruise. Next morning, there's time to reflect. The engines have performed spectacularly. Uh, we've had a few little niggling problems with one or two, but they're uh, teething problems. This is me at the moment. I'm, I'm having a whale of a time, and I'm going to see the world. The thing about college is that you can always... Home's only a couple of hours away, whereas when you're on the other side of the world, you can't really get home at all, so... Yeah, that has hit me a little bit, but I should be fine. I just love being at sea. Like, um, you, get, you see the best sunrises, the best sunsets. There's no, no light pollution, so you see the best stars. It's just, it like, really is quite an amazing spirit experience. The ship is, in all intents and purposes, ready to sail out on its maiden voyage. But not before a very important tradition has been carried out by Dame Helen Mirren. I name this ship Ventura. May God bless her and all who sail in her. Here we go. Next time on the Merchant Navy, Singapore Dock spells danger for the captain of a giant oil tanker. I look at everybody and I see all their fingers and thumbs and I hope that when they go home, they've still got the same fingers and thumbs in the same place. For the junior officers, it means time exploring. A lot of my friends will never see these places that I've been to and seen.